a lot of the time we encounter uh, spine tumors once we have the diagnosis and what to do and how to manage these patients comes, uh, comes down to a number of key factors. Uh, where I like to get involved is um, if we have a vascular tumor of the spine and the surgeon believes um, that the vascularity will cause a problem during the procedure and that's where I will step in and I just want to talk about the endovascular surgery uh, aspect of treating spine tumors. I'm going to keep it pretty simple today in terms of the overall lecture outline, um, but there, are, you know, spine tumors can be classified into uh, there's various classifications for spine tumors. I think you all remember Dr. Boriani when he came here several months ago, and he gave a fantastic presentation on how he looks at uh, spine tumors, how he looks at the classification schemes, and how he resects these tumors. Um, I'm going to keep it more simple than that. There are certainly intracanicular or interspinal tumors that um, are primary tumors of the spine and spinal cord. Um, tumors that are, are, are involved uh, within the tissue of the spine, including meningiomas, um, par paragliomas, and hemangioblastomas. Um, today, I'm going to talk about more about uh, hypervascular metastases. 70% uh, of all uh, lesions uh, of the spine uh, in, in, uh, in the setting of vascular tumors are metastatic disease. And of all patients who get uh, some form of metastatic disease from other sources, uh, almost 50% will have some form of spine bone uh, involvement. And that's where I think endovascular can shine and help a surgeon uh, manage these patients. So just in terms of the overall uh, diagnosis, again, not to make it too complicated and what we just talked about just now, when you're looking at differential for metastasis once you've made that diagnosis, uh, it's very, a couple of factors helps you help you kind of make the decision of what this is. One is obviously location, whether which part of the vertebral body it can lay in. Um, other uh, diagnoses, as Dr. Siegel might have uh, talked about earlier, which I may have missed, is whether or not these lesions are multiple, um, whether uh, they involve um, other levels, uh, whether they involve other parts of the body that are contiguous with the spine, including anter anterior to the column, including soft tissues uh, and the, and the um, uh, in the in the uh, spinous process region as well as uh, in the body in the thoracic region and involving large structures there that can be seen on uh, normal imaging. And how far is the extension of these tumors uh, outside of the bone itself? As I said, I'm going to talk about and focus on metastases since they're the most common bone lesion that we'll see in the spine and the most common lesion that will uh, be aggressively sought uh, as after as treatment for and uh, to do a procedure such as a large vertebral corpectomy. There are obviously a number of cancers that, out, that, are, that love the spine. I like to divide these metastases into those that you know, destroy bone, um, make bone, or do a combination of both. Uh, and then there are certain tumors, such as a renal cell carcinoma, that can be more vascular than others. So in a patient who has a history, for example, renal cell carcinoma, uh, it's very important to, to understand and realize that these patients will, if they do develop bone metastases, these are very vascular lesions and may benefit from endovascular surgery or endovascular embolization and treatment. Uh, tumors that are less likely to be vascular include prostate carcinoma um, but and, and lymphoma, and certainly the diagnosis for lymphoma needs to be made pretty quickly, and we talked about the controversy between biopsy versus going for immediate uh, resection earlier this year. So what are the goals of endovascular surgery? Uh, well, for, for, for the whole team, including myself and for the uh, surgeon who is going to be doing the actual procedure, um, no, numerous studies uh, have uh, proven that they, that they decrease intraoperative blood loss if we're able to embolize this tumor ahead of time. Now, uh, Dr. Eskridge, who used to be here, uh, a couple of years ago, he wrote the first couple of papers in the early 90s about this uh, with, a, with a set of 18 patients that he had preoperatively embolized at, at the University of Washington. Um, and they've all shown, and, and, and since then, there's been a number of papers, including most recently in 2015 and prior to that in 2009, that have kind of revalidated the fact that there is a decrease in intra, intraoperative blood loss if we preoperatively embolize these patients. And what kind of vol volumes are we take, talking about? Well, undertaking a complete corpectomy, uh, an en bloc resection of a vertebral body, uh, can lead up to up to five liters of blood loss. Uh, and it's important to prepare the surgeon, prepare the anesthesiologist for such a, an event, uh, which you know is normally a cycle or two of blood, of blood 
uh, exchange with a patient uh, during a case. So it helps to prepare the surgeon. And with embolization, uh, pa there's papers that have uh, reported a decrease uh, of blood loss from four liters to about a thousand liter, a thousand uh, cc's, one liter. So I think that uh, in preparation for the surgeon, it helps. And then uh, the more uh, uh, you know distant goals, but certainly uh, in the in the realm of a surgeon, uh, in terms of thinking about a tumor. Tumors are vascular, and if they are vascular, where are the feeders? Where are the blood vessels that come in and out of the tumor? How can we identify those preoperatively? It makes a difference. Uh, shortening operative time, since you can get around the tumor quickly and not have to worry about blood loss. Um, increases the Increasing the chance of complete resection. That uh, can help with a tumor that has been embolized and essentially, essentially softened uh, for the surgeon so that they can get around it uh, comfortably or know where the vascular structures are and maybe target them first. And a lofty goal that has been hypothesized, um, but there has been no long outcome data, is does preoperative embolization decrease the likelihood of tumor recurrence? Um, I think that, uh, that people have hypothesized that, but I don't think it's been proven. So the gold standard for vascularity and knowing how vascular tumor is, is using a diagnostic cerebral angiogram or digital sub subtraction angiography, and they get a spinal angiogram. Now, patients uh, typically get a spinal angiogram, and if, and if um, you know the location of the lesion on pre-op imaging. It helps the, you know, person doing the angiogram where to focus because, you know, let, let's just face it, the spine is a huge structure and the aorta is a large structure and trying to find every vascular pedicle from the aorta can be uh, difficult to do if you don't have a focused uh, understanding of where the lesion is. Uh, an angiographic architecture of the lesion is important to know and it, this helps, the, the angiogram helps. And as I'd mentioned previously in the previous slide, uh, when the surgeon knows which feeders are coming in and out of the vessel, it can of, often help a surgeon uh, decide on which, which, which side to approach the lesion, uh, how much uh, to go for, and uh, how aggressive to be, uh, obviously, guarding the resection. Now, this, I think, the next couple of slides, I think, are the most important, although the most boring. Uh, so I think that um, this is, this is I probably, arguably, the most important slide of my talk in terms of understanding the vascular anatomy. I think people don't appreciate, you know, what, how complicated and how profuse the vascular anatomy is. Um, we have, obviously, the, the aorta here, which sits on the left side uh, of the vertebral body. And this is a cross-section of the vertebral body just showing uh, the uh, paravertebral and prevertebral anastomoses that occur uh, uh, and supply the vertebral body in total. And here is the spinal cord itself and with its own specific supply, the anterior spinal artery here, uh, the two posterior spinal arteries there. And you can see that there has been a, uh, there's a, a huge uh, network uh, of blood vessels around the, around the system. Now this is important obviously for understanding uh, a number of key factors about how to treat and embolize these patients. From, a, from my standpoint as a proceduralist, I'm, I'm moving up the aorta with a catheter, and, uh, and the catheter is, is going to be parked in, in one of these vessels here, and that way we can actually you know, identify where the, where, where the blood supply for the vertebral body is, for example, and w how that relates to the blood supply to the, to the spinal cord itself. Um, I'm not going to go through all the different blood vessels. I'll, I'll, this presentation is I'll, I'll give to anyone who wants it. I think this is a great slide just to give you a, a sense of well, what we're facing and what challenges we're facing. This is a great slide. Oh. If you can go back one slide, yeah. it was really great. I'd love to have a copy. Of course, yeah. But you're probably the only person in the room who can explain the word Folsom to me. Oh, uh, well, um, it, basically in the 1800s, I believe it uh, may uh, have meant that uh, uh, a, a kind of a polite way of saying too forward, maybe too masculine, maybe too horny, I, don't, I think. You know, that was a nice way of saying being too, too forward, too, too, um, too inappropriate, you know, basically. Um, uh, but, Thank you. sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Here's, here's another slide, a different view. This is a cross-section, uh, and uh, well, not, this is not a cross-section, it's a 3D uh, version of the same thing. Um, and basically, uh, again, just to describe how complicated the anastomosis are. Um, now, again, the aorta sitting on the left side of the vertebral body, um, you have numerous paravertebral uh, segmental arteries that connect uh, to the spinal cord eventually and the, and the dura surrounding it. Um, important things in the structures to know, obviously, are the radiant, the, um, the radial arteries, the uh, radial peel arteries that come off of each dorsal root, or sorry, each, each root, nerve root, 
uh, and over sheath, and then the uh, numerous, numerous uh, paravertebral and vasocrine around the spinal cord. Um, very important to understand this when we're trying to understand the vascularity of a tumor. Now, you've probably seen uh, in your in your careers um, tumors that have completely destroyed the vertebral body, have completely eroded through part the the, um, the posterior elements and possibly invading the spinal cord. But you can un understand how important it is to perhaps get an angiogram to understand all this information ahead of time before going in there and just deciding you're going to do a corpectomy. Um, so I think it, it has value. I'm going to go through a few uh, angiogram images. Um, the first I want to start with the lumbar images. Now, when this, these are the vertebral bodies uh, on, on the native images. There's a catheter here, and I've parked it into a segmental lumbar artery. So when someone asks me, uh, can you look for the vascularity of you know, L4, or there's a, there's, a tumor, there's a tumor in L4 I want to see, I, in the lumbar spine, I look for that segmental artery and we'll inject you know, two or three cc's of contrast and, and, and kind of see where the blood vessels are. <coughs> Usually, um, this is a single level, but if you inject hard enough, you can actually uh, see uh, you know, paravertebral anastomoses with other levels. Uh, and you can actually uh, get a, a sense of how connected each segmental level is. On, the, on this image, I wanted to show that we were lucky enough to do a, a, I think a, an injection where you can actually see uh, the posterior, uh, on the posterior uh, side of the vertebral body, there's a diamond-shaped network, um, and that you can see here, uh, or hexagonal-shaped network um, of blood vessels, and that's the that's the post-vertebral or um, you know behind the vertebral body plexus that is not easily seen. But I think there's a good picture of that. And then finally, uh, when you have tumors of the sacrum. Uh, there's a median sacred artery, which comes off of um, uh, either L4 uh, or, or L5. And here you see that sometimes uh, there's a common origin with segmental arteries for L5 in this case. And this central artery, that it's easy to pick up on this. This is a normal case. Um, it comes down into the sacrum, and that's very important to know that structure when you're embolizing tumors of the sacrum. Yep. The, uh, the picture on the far left. Yep. Um, where, where in relation to the psoas is that vessel crossing the disc space? Just as I think about a direct viral approach. Where in relation to the psoas yeah, is, is that? Is that, uh, is that, is that like anterior, posterior, uh, or more what you see? From a lateral approach, that's going to be uh, way posterior to what you're going to see from a lateral approach. So that's, that's yeah. closer to the, the your <coughs> Correct, yeah, yeah. yeah. And obviously, as you get more distal, there's going to be anastomosis with the vascular network of the psoas in itself. So. This is the cervical region. Now, what's important and what people don't realize often is that if, if there's a tumor of the cervical region, there is a, a good connection or cross flow between the vertebral artery and the, 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 the supply of the spinal cord. So it's not always just a direct spinal cord, uh, you know, uh, involvement uh, or anastomoses from other vessels. Um, we have uh, other blood vessels. This one is a picture of the deep cervical, and this little tiny arrow uh, shown here shows basically uh, the anterior spinal artery being fed by the deep cervical artery. And here you have a supreme intercostal um, blood vessel that supplies the uh, spinal cord too. These pictures just highlight the fact that when you're looking at, when we look at textbooks, you think of the, the anterior spinal artery and it's nice color picture netter that comes off the vertebral arteries and connects and is a nice contiguous segment uh, conti uh, down the, the cervical spinal cord. That's not the case at all. Um, and uh, you have a rich anastomotic network from the deep cervical arteries, sometimes the costal cervical arteries, um, and uh, the vertebral artery uh, to give that rich anastomotic network around, a, um, around the cervical cord. And so it's important to understand this before uh, going in and doing an operation or doing an embolization. And some, sometimes the supreme intercostal uh, blood uh, supply will also um, augment the cervical supply as well. And finally, it would be a miss for me not to mention uh, uh, the artery Adamkowitz. Um, it is uh, a radicular medullary artery that you know uh, supplies uh, the anterior spinal artery or contributes to the spinal artery. It arises from the left-hand side of the a, a cord or aorta in 90% of cases <coughs> or 80% of cases. Uh, typically between uh, T10 or T9 and L2, um, but the majority of the time between the 9th and 12th uh, intercostal artery. 
in the thoracic spine. Uh, in this picture here, I have a good injection of, of a segmental artery, and then you have the radicular medullary artery here con connecting and basically developing the anterior spinal artery. You can barely see a whiff of it uh, going north as well. It's not uncommon for someone to have more than one uh, radio uh, medullary peel um, uh, supplied to the anterior spinal artery. Uh, so sometimes the artery radiomicovids can be duplicated or seen twice, and sometimes it's very important to know that uh, when you're doing uh, embolizations because you don't want to embolize, obviously, this may just apply to the anterior spinal artery. So just to, get to, bit, to change gears, get a bit more technical, uh, how do I do this or how do we do this? Um, there's three major devices that we use now in the modern era. There used to be t a ton of other things available. Um, Mechanical devices, coils, platinum coils that we usually use for aneurysms in the brain. We can use them for embolizing tumors of the spine. Particular agents, uh, polyvinyl alcohol particles, particles that range from 25 to 500 microns in, in diameter that look like sand, essentially. Uh, and you can inject this sand, as I like to call it, uh, into the tumor, uh, and that can cause sclerosis and necrosis of the tumor. And then two of the more newer agents include NBCA and Onyx. Onyx you may have heard about. Dr. Monteith has spoken to, about it up here before, but in the treatment of AVMs and arteriovenous malformations of dural AV fistulas of the brain and spine. But you can also use it as an embolic agent for, for, uh, tumors, of the, um, for tumors of the vertebral bodies. Uh, NBCA is basically just crazy glue. Uh, I think they just remarketed crazy glue or gorilla glue as, as something for, for the brain. They just changed one, uh, I'm sure you've, uh, you know, they've changed one like chem chemical compound in it, but uh, it's no different from crazy glue. Um, it's very useful, but it is like crazy glue. It's very hard to control. Uh, and once you get something, when something gets stuck, you can't unstick it. And so um, that's why Onyx developed. You can actually control Onyx better. Uh, here's just what they look like. Embosphere <coughs> is, is a company that makes the uh, polyvinyl uh, alcohol spheres. Uh, onyx is a cohesive agent. Uh, cohesive meaning it sticks to itself and nothing else. So unlike crazy glue, uh, crazy glue sticks to everything, <coughs> BCA, uh, onyx sticks only to itself. Uh, and that's what's nice about it. It doesn't uh, tend to spread uh, and go uh, places that you have no, have no control, unlike the other two things, with the sand and the glue, which you have very little control. The nice thing about the sand is that it can get deeper, deeper penetration. So some of the, the nuances in what we choose, it basically depends on what, it, what the an architecture, uh, angio architecture looks like, what the, what the blood vessels look like, um, and what they look like in relation to the spinal tumor. The polyvinyl alcohol little sand, sand particles are great. They give you deep, deep penetration. However, you can't control them. So just like pouring sand anywhere else, they can go to places you don't want if you don't have good control. Um, but they do; they can get very deep into a, a lesion, and sometimes that's very that's preferential uh, for for a vertebral body tumor. MBCA uh, is doesn't do as much of that, but uh, it's harder to control. Uh, uh, more like onyx, just like crazy glue. Onyx is, seems to be the, the newest agent on the market. Doesn't give us good penetration, but very easy to control and tends to be the safest uh, if we use anything. Coils uh, are pretty much useless unless you use them to direct your onyx or your sand. So we will use coils to help, to, for two reasons: to help a surgeon localize the level. Sometimes it's nice to do that for a surgeon when they do when they do intraoperative thoracotomy. If you see coils, you're like, "That's the way <coughs> to do it. Do the do the initial incision." Um, and it will also help to basically act as a dam to, pre to, to prevent particles or glue going in the wrong direction and direct it uh, in the right direction towards the, the tumor. All, all procedures um, we do under general anesthesia um, so that we can actually have the patient have an, an apneic spell uh, and ask the anesthesiologist to stop the patient breathing so that we can get great images. Um, and the other important uh, nuance is that we want to get really selective with your catheters uh, within a tumor. So before, we didn't have great catheters 20 years ago, and we couldn't get deep into a tumor. Um, but now, there is no excuse not to get right within a tumor before injecting your embolic agent. The timing of embolization, it's controversial. Uh, what's crazy is that there's like literally 100 papers on this, but none of them, none of them have compared whether early or, or stage resection is, is um, 
beneficial. There are papers that say that you should do it within 24 hours because you don't want the tumor to kind of find its own way back or revascularize. Um, there are other people who, who recommend that you should wait four to seven days um, because there's a softening phenomenon of the tumor and that can peak at day four. Um, and so by day seven, it makes the surgery so much easier. But again, there, it's controversial. I haven't seen any papers, no, no imaging papers, no outcome papers that say that this is going to make a difference. Uh, it just goes by gestalt. And I think all, most authors in the literature argue about this all the time. Um, and so I think that the, there's a good opportunity to kind of probably study that in the future. Um, complications. Uh, there are basically a couple of major complications. But for me, the most important complication is causing <coughs> spinal cord. Now, um, knock on wood, it hasn't happened to Dr. Monteith and I uh, since we've been starting to do this. But in the literature, it can be reported as high as 6.5% in certain tumors causing uh, cord ischemia. And that can be devastating. Again, as I mentioned earlier, an understanding of the, an the anatomy is very important. And so uh, before I even attempt an embolization, I really get to a chance to Look, look at all the blood vessels supplying a tumor. And I haven't been afraid to tell Jens or Rod or Dr. Hanscom that we can't do this. Uh, we can't do this embolization because it's just too dangerous. So there is that, uh, you know, there is that, uh, I guess, bravery in not doing much because it can, we might cause a problem. Does that vary based on the material used for the Yes, it varies greatly on the material used. So I tend to you tend to have a higher stroke rate with the sand um, because you can't control it as well. Um, but on the flip side, the sand has the best um, outcomes in terms of blood loss if you're able to get it. And Dr. Eskridge, when he used to work here and at UW, he used to embolize not only the level of the, where the tumor is, but three levels above and three levels below. And so even in the normal vertebral body, because he believed that whole concept of the paravertebral anastomosis co contributing to the tumor vascularity. And he used to get great results, but his complication rate was a little bit higher. It wasn't 6.5%, but you just, you have to, you know, pair that with what you can do with the tumor. And for some people who are already paralyzed or already have, you know, you're doing this tumor almost like, you're doing this surgery almost as palliation, maybe it doesn't matter. I think it's an ethical and personal choice between you and the patient you know, how aggressive you want to be. And lastly, uh, microcatheter breakage happens when you're using glue or, or some other uh, agent. If the catheter gets stuck because the glue has, has glued the catheter in, you have, to, you have to pull these things out. And that can actually, you can leave pieces of catheter within the, within the patient. Um, that's my last slide. I don't think I have anything else to say. I'm just going to leave it up to questions.